Well now, if you've been watching my recent videos, then you probably know I've been doing a review of the Spyro the Dragon trilogy in celebration of the remaster coming out this year. I'm not going to repeat myself here, so if you want to hear my full-length spiel about the trilogy as a whole and my stance on video games in general, head on over to the countdown I did of the first game. Links are in the description below. Without wasting any more time, let's just dive right into it. Continuing from the success of the first game, its sequel picks up right where the first one left off, in which Spyro, now voiced by Tom Kenny, who's given voice to practically every cartoon character imaginable, is itching to go on a vacation after his victory over Nasty Nork. But fate has other plans when he's kidnapped, I mean, transported to the realm of Avalar instead. There, he finds out that the locals are being terrorized by this... rhino... dinosaur... lizard person named Ripto. So now with the help of the lovely Allura, athletic but clumsy hunter, greedy money bags, helpful Zoe the fairy, and the absent-minded professor, Spyro must journey through a whole new magical land to save the world and find his way home. And maybe finally go on vacation. Most fans seem to regard this game as the best of the trilogy, and it's easy to see why. From the better graphics to the explosion of new characters to the game mechanics, virtually everything has been upgraded and improved on. Stuart Copeland is back with another fantastic score, and to complement this, we get a more complex story complex in the sense that there's a bigger variety of worlds to explore, with each realm having its own unique characters and problems that Spyro needs to help solve if he's to get any closer to stopping Ripto. Which, speaking of whom, this installment has a way better villain who became the most popular antagonist of the trilogy, and for good reason. He's the only villain to fully exchange dialogue with Spyro, making the conflict more personal. And he has a much more memorable Napoleon complex personality, turning him into the villain we love to hate. But it's not just the villains who change, Spyro gets a big upgrade as well, gaining four new abilities, swimming, climbing, head bashing, and most useful of all, a hover move that can give you a tiny extra boost if and when you're gliding someplace and you come up just a tiny bit short of a ledge. Pro tip, if you've been playing the second or third game for a while, then decide to play the first game again, try to remember that the hover move didn't exist yet or else... yeah. So with this new adventure came new worlds to visit and even more diverse challenges with shiny talismans and orbs to collect instead of rescuing dragons. Because you know, they were all rescued, right? Nasty, in spite of his misguided nature, was a worthy opponent. Uh-oh. Here we go again! Eh, they'll be fine. Anyway, without further ado, let's get started. Same rules as before apply. Flight levels, boss battles, and homeworlds are also included. These are my top 10 favorite levels from Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage. Number 10. Crystal Glacier. Okay, remember what I said in my previous video about not typically liking snow or ice levels? Okay, confession time. In general, I've never really been a huge fan of snow, ice, winter theme levels. Maybe it's because winter's my least favorite season and I tend to get depressed around that time of year, I don't know. But for the most part, whenever I encountered a cold level in a game, I'm just sort of meh towards them. Yeah, that. Well, now watch me be a hypocrite and include an ice level in this list. But hey, I never said I totally disliked ice levels, as this stage proves there are exceptions, if they're done right. And for me, this is one of the most enjoyable, well-done ice levels I've ever come across in a video game. The main mission here is that this gang of evil Frosty the Snowmen have kidnapped the leader of these cute cave guys, and it's your job to rescue him. Even more urgent, he has the tickets to the hockey game in Colossus Valley. Remember, you gotta keep your priorities straight. Anyway, this stage manages to take everything that I normally find annoying or boring in ice theme levels and makes it great. The background music is pleasant to listen to and instantly puts a chill in the air, but is warm at the same time, if that makes any sense. Most music in ice theme stages either sound cold and desolate or resort to sounding like jingle bells, which is the easy way out. But this tune, to me, is somehow able to let you know that the environment is cold but still inviting. 
reading. To add to this, the art design is fantastic, with the whole world being covered in white snow, but manages to be arguably one of the most colorful stages in the game. The blues, greens, and pinks covering all the characters, houses, and caves pops out, making what would normally be considered a desolate place come alive. The mini-games here are also a lot of fun, from flaming a bunch of spiders in a cave to helping one of the cavemen find his incredibly adorable snow leopard. And speaking of the characters, the tribesmen here are one of my favorite characters in the game. They're arguably the most proactive NPCs, helping you make your way through the stage, not to mention being incredibly funny. Spyro, just hold tight for a second and look out below! Ow. Oh. You think those guys could have got me out of here without rolling a two-ton snowball onto my head? Here, take this crystal. I traded some hockey tickets for it. With memorable, funny characters and great art design, this is an ice level done right. Number 9. Aquaria Towers. I think most people tend to go through an ocean phase at some point in their life, and I was no different. Even to this day, I have a tiny love from the beach and sea creatures and stuff. As such, this stage comes off as a really well-designed and fun water level. In this mission, these funny-looking guys with the shock sticks have drained all the water from the seahorse's city, and now we gotta get the water back. Okay, sounds simple enough, except when you gotta contend with Sebastian's evil cousins, the funny looking guys with the shock sticks and Robo Jaws. games here are fun, from helping the Seahorse King get his children back to riding a manta ray through an obstacle course, something the developers must have loved because Hunter's manta ray appeared again in the third game. And I love the designs of this city and the buildings. It's like Atlantis mixed with Futurama, second only to Metropolis, more on that later. But before we move on, just a couple random things of note. One, weird as this sounds, this is where I first learned what the word calamari meant. The shock stick guys are tough. Yesterday they turned Vern, our giant squid, into fried calamari. See, video games can teach you stuff. Two, please tell me I'm not the only one who thought the King's Seahorse was a girl at first. The water workers have kidnapped six of my children and hidden them in the tops of these numbered towers. I borrowed some explosives to blast the doors off the towers. Guess that's my fault for not reading his name at first. And finally, three, okay, so I like the gimmick of having to turn the one the water, and as such, more of the level becomes accessible, the more that it gets filled up. I think that's pretty clever. And then, once you fill the entire stage, this last area at the very tippy top is reachable. Which leads to two things. One, when going for 100%, dummy me spent ages swimming around trying to figure out where I was missing orbs and gems, not thinking that an entire third of the level would be semi-hidden right above me. Which leads to two... How did the water up here not flood the city immediately? The switch that I turned on is a different hatch than the one that leads up to this area, and when you get up here, you can see that it leads into a vast ocean. How is the ocean magically staying up there? Furthermore, why does this city full of aquatic citizens have a way of draining away all their life-giving water to begin with? Or maybe I'm just asking too many questions and expecting too much out of a game designed for 10-year-olds. Well, physic-defying laws aside, this is one of the better examples of a great water-themed stage and always gets me in the mood for a trip to the beach. Number 8. Summer Forest. Like I said at the start, I am including homeworlds as levels. When the sequels rolled around, they did away with having enemies in the homeworlds like in the first game. But even with no bad guys to fight, that doesn't mean there's nothing to do here. Quite the opposite. You still have to hunt for treasure, you still have orbs to find and puzzles to solve, and it's here that you learn your new abilities. Summer Forest is a beautiful homeworld with the most peaceful atmospheric music I've ever heard. I love how the castle is kind of built into and melds with the green hills 
of the valley I'm assuming it's in, though it's a bit baffling that the designer of this place makes you have to swim underwater just to get inside the thing. We never see Alora Moneybags or Hunter swim their way inside here, so is there some secret back way in that they're not telling Spyro about? And if there is, why make him swim for it? Are you on his side or not? Well, putting a logic aside for the moment, you finally get to learn to swim, which I think made kids everywhere rejoice that water wasn't instant death anymore. Hunter's challenge is pretty basic, but also important, as you learn what's arguably the trilogy's best new ability, the hover technique. No more finicky gliding or coming up just a tiny bit short of your jumps or dropping like a rock. Just try to remember that the first game didn't have this, or else you'll make the same mistake I did, and... Yeah. Finally, this world has three fairly well-hidden orbs to find, one in a door puzzle that kept little me stumped for a while, one on a ledge that you can't even get to until you learn an ability in the next home world, and one in the secret tower that you'll only find if you take the time to thoroughly explore the castle grounds. Much like the first game, it says a lot about the game's uniqueness that the developers would make what's basically the level select screen a stage unto itself, and much like Artisans, is a great introduction to a great sequel. Number 7 Metropolis I understand You do? No, not that Metropolis This Metropolis It's kind of fitting that this would be one of the last levels in the game Because they really pulled out all the stops before you finally face Ripto Taking place in a futuristic city populated by robots You must help the citizens fight back against an alien invasion of farm animals in spacesuits and flying saucers? You know, guys, hmm. it just dawned on me how, how weird this film is, you know? Yeah, it's really. It's kind of goofy. Okay, I actually think this is one of the funniest ideas the trilogy ever came up with, and clever, too. After so many old jokes about crop circles and cows being abducted, this just takes the joke to the next level. There's also this interesting bit of dialogue. This insurrection from the farms has got quite out of hand. We need someone to restore order. Find the inventor droid. She's been working on something big. Okay, two things. One, I love the voices of the robots. They're like friendly, cuddly, cute Cybermen. Scans detect your cyber armor is cooler than mine. Where did you get it? And two, by insurrection from the farms, I'm assuming he means the Robotica Farms level, bringing up a point that I neglected to mention earlier. Throughout this game, I love how all these worlds are connected to each other in some way, shape, or form, and cross over with one another. Like the dudes in Crystal Glacier mentioning the hockey game in Colossus, or how Zephyr and Breeze Harbor are at war with each other, or how all the levels have some other level to parallel it, like Glimmer and Hercos, Idle Springs and Colossus, Fracture Hills and Magma Cone, etc. It's a really clever and ingenious idea that really fleshes out this world and makes you feel it's worth saving. But I digress, back to Metropolis. Anyway, I love the design of this city. Much like Crystal Glacier, it easily could have taken the cliché route and made everything dull gray steel or something, but instead chose to make it bright and colorful akin to the Jetsons. The enemies are hilarious, especially these flying jetpack pigs, insert pigs flying joke here. And though nothing will ever beat the screaming guys from Dr. Shemp, this one's a close second. You can almost see the thought process of the pig as it realizes what's about to happen. It's like, oh no, this was a mistake. I screwed up. Abort! 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 As for the mini-games, it's kind of split down the middle. The one where you have to ice skate and blow the bombs back at the ox is okay. Not too difficult, though it can get pretty tedious, and personally, I don't think it quite fits in with the rest of the stage, but this is the only negative. The one with shooting down the flying saucers, however, is awesome. For the first time, we get a double power-up as we get to fly around and unleash the super flame on UFO sheep. And the UFO sheep is something I never thought I'd have to say. Pretty fun stuff, though one thing still puzzles me. Who built all these robots? Why do they have emotions? Where are the organic people? Did some post-apocalyptic crap happen where the machines rose up and took over and they're only pretending to be nice but the farm animals were the real residents and were actually tricked into killing off the last of the resistance and now nothing is standing in the machine's way of taking over Avalar? I bet you the inventor droid is behind it. Her voice does stand out from the other robot voices. She's probably the most self-aware of them all. Or 
I'm just taking this game way too seriously again. With great set design and memorable characters, this is a great last hurrah before facing off with the final boss. Number 6. Idle Springs. Back to an early level. In fact, for most people, this was the first portal they jumped into in the game, and then found out that they couldn't even access more than a third of the stage without learning how to swim first, meaning that Colossus was actually supposed to be the first completable stage. Oops. Well, in subsequent replays, I think we all remembered this little detail and saved this stage for later so we didn't have to backtrack. Funny thing, I've also come across more than a few debates over which level was better, this or Colossus, since these two stages are the parallel to each other. Well, since this one ended up on my list, you obviously know which camp I fell into. As memorable as the Yeti and the hockey game are, I just find this stage more fun overall. For some weird reason, the statues these woodcarvers made start coming to life and terror in the place, so it's up to us to set things straight. Make no mistake, it's a fairly easy level and pretty linear, but the Tiki guys are what make it funny, the way they use these shish kebabs and other stuff to chase the foreman around. The music is also great, setting the mood of being in a hot spring or humid swamp pretty well. Great enough that the theme is reused again in Fracture Hills. And finally, there's the orb challenges. The one where you save the Hulid answers is pretty cute, but I think the one everyone remembers is having to solve the three puzzles. Lighting up all the blocks, feeding the tiki head, playing the Simon game. It's simple, yet so fun. And colorful, too. Personally, my favorite of the three was feeding the fish to the idol. It seems a lot of people had trouble with this one, but I never did. You just have to be patient and not mash the button every time a fish pops up. I'm not even quite sure why I like it the most. Maybe it's how colorful the fish are. Maybe I think the idol gobbling the fish is kind of cute. Maybe it's how the animators went through the trouble of having the fish swimming around with you in the pond instead of taking the lazy way out and just having the pond be empty until attention is called to the fish. Fish. I don't know. Sometimes you don't have a fancy explanation for why you like something, nor do you need one. It's just a charming and fun early level with two really funny opening and closing cutscenes, some cool mini games, and enjoyable characters. Number 5 Mystic March Proof on why you should never fall asleep at the job, here's another very humorous stage that I've heard many comments saying it's one of their favorites, yet for some reason doesn't get talked about a lot. It's another late stage in the game, and the story is simple, but sets up an interesting little mystery. These, uh, monks? Muppets? Muppet monks? Have a magic fountain that they, uh, I guess pray to? Either that or they just like making jazz hands. Either way, things start going haywire when the fountain suddenly shuts off, and now we gotta find out what evil fiend is behind all this. I won't spoil the twist here, but it along with the ending cutscene always made me laugh, and the few clues I dropped throughout this might give you a hint. Anyway, while the enemies here arguably aren't as memorable as the ones at other stages, the one that no one forgets is these snail... elephant... things. Meek elephants on parade, here they come, hippity hoppity. They're here, and there are big elephants everywhere! The map is also fairly large, with tons of nooks and crannies to explore and secret paths to discover, especially underwater. But really, the best thing about this stage is the missions. One involves helping this safari guy get his jeep running after some thieves steal components from his truck. Thieves that, strangely enough, are not the na 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 na, -na dudes, but somehow manage to be even harder to catch. Also, is it just me, or does this guy remind me of that hunter dude from those old Cool Cat cartoons? Ah, Spyro, a friendly face. A bunch of rotten thieves have stolen the spark plugs, and I'm stuck here. Please get the four plugs back. I've suffered the last defeat at the hands of my cursed nemesis, Cool Cat. Why, his preposterous antics have been my absolute undoing. But the one that I, and I think everyone remembers the most, is the challenge where you have to trade all this weird stuff to get the professor's pencil back. What's odd is that this mission can either be super easy or super hard, and it all depends on if you know what you're looking for, because the game gives you next to no hint of what to do. The only clue you get is that as you make your way across the map, you may come across a few items that just sort of stick out 
out from everything else. They just seem like random things to include in the environment that don't do anything. But if you have a good eye and even better memory, you'll soon figure out what their purpose actually is. You must trade for the egg, Greasy Ed Boy. Trade? For what? With fun missions, an interesting world, and a hilarious plot twist, this stage will make you think twice on where you decide to take a nap. <laughs> Number 4 Autumn Plains Back to another homeworld, and my favorite of the three in the game. Much like in Summer Forest, the music and atmosphere here is so peaceful, and along with it containing eight realms and two speedways, it's also the largest hub world of the three. Look at this place. It's freaking massive. Moneybags also shows up no less than four times. Once to teach you how to climb, and three more times to open portals. How much money do you want, dude? Actually, a better question is, how are you getting all around this castle so quickly? Like, look here! You can't fly! How the heck did you get on this island way out here? Is there some teleportation skill you're not teaching us? Getting serious though, I really love the design of this huge castle. I can remember spending so much time just wandering around here, taking in the scenery and appreciating the fact that out of the three castles from each homeworld, this one seems the most plausible and functional as an actual castle to live in, versus the other two that are either super small or make you have to swim underwater to get to it. This place also contains two orbs, one of which is my favorite to get, not just in the homeworlds but in the entire game. Funny how this place is so huge, yet it only has two orbs to find while Summer Forest has a whopping four. Anyway, one of them is cleverly hidden behind the bricks at the end of this wall. The other one, awkwardly enough, took me ages to find. For some reason, oblivious me couldn't notice the cracks in this wall and thought it was just part of the background and it took having to consult a guide to find it. Upon busting through the wall like the Kool-Aid man, you gain access to an interesting section of the stage. One that takes you all the way to the very tippy top of the castle, so much so that you can actually hear the wind blowing from being so high up. From here, you can glide to virtually anywhere in the homeworld, including this little spot. Way out so far that it's practically off the map. But it's so satisfying to take that huge leap of faith and rotate the camera around you as you take the longest glide of your life. If only they had switched things around a bit and had this be the final homeworld, it would have been the perfect capper on such an awesome game. Number 3 Ripto's Arena Well, much like the previous video, I guess this list wouldn't be complete without at least one boss battle on it. And if I'm going to feature any of them, it has to be the final face-off against Ripto. You'll notice that in the second and third games, the boss battles got a major upgrade. They were bigger, more threatening, an unskippable requirement to advance forward in the game, and took place in battle arenas rather than making you run around all over a level. But Ripto takes the cake. He's not only my favorite boss in this game, he's my favorite boss in the entire trilogy. The developers were clearly proud of this game and wanted to give it the epic finale it deserved, and boy do we get it. Ironically enough, Ripto took me the longest to beat, so much so that I actually beat Hero the Dragon first and then this one, and it's all because of this little Napoleon archetype. This fight takes everything that's awesome about a boss fight, combines it with making it fit the story thematically, and does it right. All those orbs you were collecting throughout the game, it wasn't just to open Open the door to the boss, Elora and the Professor power up the orbs with all sorts of magic to give you temporary power-ups, including Supercharge, Super Flame, and these green bomb thingies. Just don't let Ripto get a hold of them or else he can turn the powers right back at you. And speaking of the characters, that's another thing. All the main characters, well, Hunter anyway, Elora and the Professor, just mentioned by Zoe, show up to help, which is fitting since they drag Spyro into this mess to begin with. 
And now for some fun facts. One, I think part of what made this fight hard was that when it got to the second phase with the Robocalp, little me thought you had to somehow hit Ripto while he was on top of them. I didn't know you could just hit Gulp. Two, did anyone notice that Hunter pretty much just died right there? How did he not get engulfed in lava? And three, this music is epic, but what's up with the opera singer? Both exciting and intense, this will go down as the most memorable boss battle I've ever experienced, and it's the perfect climactic ending to a fantastic game. Number 2 Glimmer So I'm starting to notice a pattern here. If both this and the last list are any indication, it seems a big chunk of my favorite stages consist mostly of early levels. I guess the developers really wanted all their games to make a big first impression, and I could think of no better introduction than Glimmer. Rather than a home world, you're immediately dropped into the game's first level, and from here you instantly see just how different this sequel is going to be in comparison to the last game. The music is a bit faster and upbeat, the graphics have improved, the power-ups work differently, the gems and treasure chests are completely different, there's characters all over the place, and more importantly, they talk to you, and the environment is busy, but in a good way. Everything is moving, there's always something to collect, new things to collect, something's always happening, it's clear we're not in the Dragon Realms anymore. You can only imagine how much my mind was blown back when I first played this upon being hit with so much new stuff at once. It was awesome. The level itself is designed very well, introducing you to all the main mechanics of the new game and how it's going to operate, as well as most of our new characters, and even an orb challenge that you can't access until you learn a new skill later. Unless you use the power-up outside to fly into the cave and cheat your way there, that works too. What I love most about this place, though, is the colors. By God, the colors! From the word go, I was hooked on this place. From the pastel sky, to the huge crystals in the ground, to the way all the gems glow, to the rainbows that shoot out after you light up the gem lamps. It's all just so... Ah, oh, I have no words. This place is so beautiful. Bob Ross would have a field day here. You ready to have some fun? Let's do it. <laughs> and just beat the devil out of it. Sometimes those brushes get away and they go zoom, clean the other side of the room. That's when you find out who your friends are. So if you see little creatures around your house, help take care of them because they're, they're God's little creatures and they're fantastic. Get to know them, make friends with them. And I'd paint a picture and I could paint the kind of world that I wanted. It was clean, it was sparkling, shiny, beautiful, no pollution, nobody, nobody upset. Everybody was happy in this world. Bright, energetic, and filled to the brim with bright colors, this is a fantastic opening to an equally awesome adventure. And my number one favorite level from Spyro 2, Ripto's Rage, is... Scorch. Okay, despite this series of games having weirdness all over the place, even by Spyro standards, this is a weird level, mostly in its concept. But I think it's because of its weirdness that everyone remembers it. Ask anyone about the sequel, and I guarantee you that no one forgets this stage. True, Breeze Harbor and Fracture Hills are also pretty memorable, but for other reasons. <laughs> Trouble with the trolley, eh? Trouble with the trolley, eh? Trouble with the trolley, eh? Anyway. Scorch, however, is famous for all the right reasons. And oddly enough, this and Shady Oasis are both Arabian-themed, even having similar music. Like, if we were to go over the hills here in Scorch, I can imagine Shady Oasis being right behind here. I guess someone on the development team must have liked Aladdin. Like, a lot. But of the two, Scorch gets more attention, and it's easy to see why. Like I said, the concept here is weird. There's a castle fortress thing out in the middle of the desert, and you have to fight your way through it. Okay. There's also a genie who's stealing the flags off the flagpoles. 
Okay. Hunter is also randomly here trying to get some escape monkeys back to the zoo. Considering most of our friends are a cheetah, a fawn, and a bear, I'm not sure how a zoo works in this universe, but okay. And you have to get through this fortress to help two secret agents because one of them got caught. Okay. Oh, and the two secret agents are two little kids based off of Hansel and Gretel. Uh, okay. Oh, and the siblings are apparently the Wonder Twins or something. Uh, what? Wh what? Yeah, like I said, this stage is filled with so much utter randomness when you really think about it that normally throwing such mismatched concepts together shouldn't work. And yet, somehow, it does. This was the one level I always looked forward to upon replaying the game because for how small it is, and I mean we're talking just a smidgen bigger than Dark Hollow small, it's super fun with all sorts of things to do and secret areas with tons of treasure to discover. The music is super catchy and the two mini games here are challenging enough but not so hard that you want to rip your hair out. The monkey mission's kind of funny and the capture the flag challenge can be a little tricky but not impossible with just a little perseverance. But honestly, I think what really makes this stage stand out the most is the two main characters. Hansel and, I mean, Handel and Greta, are easily one of the most infamous NPCs in the series between their cute way of speaking and the amazing things they can do. Not to mention being like six years old and yet they're secret agents for some reason. Are they Agent Zero and Agent Nine all in the same organization or something? And the developers must have loved them just as much, or at least knew the fans did, because both kids make a return in Year of the Dragon. With great music, fun challenges, memorable characters, and one of the weirdest yet most unique stage designs, Scorch is easily my pick for my favorite level. I'm Cartoon12 and I hope you enjoyed the countdown. I'll have more top 10 lists soon, including the final part to the Spyro trilogy, and links will be in the description below. If you like this video and want to see more, be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.